given the call on his time that this involves, we are very lucky to have him here in New Zealand, and it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome Steve King to Wellington. Thank you. Uh, how's the sound, by the way? Is it good? Okay. Uh, my, my hearing is dreadful, so if you ask a question, I'm going to be probably walking towards you to hear it properly. So my apologies for that. Let's, uh, let's, let's start talking about capitalism and crises. Um, now, I'm going to start with a few empirical uh, data and then go through and talk about why they matter. And I focus on the, 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 the signal that I looked at that made me believe there's going to be a financial crisis and one that was going to be biggest, the biggest one in recorded, in, certainly in, in my lifetime and probably since the uh, end of the Second World War, was this data, the ratio of private debt to GDP. I was aware of the data at various points along that curve when I was writing my own PhD back in uh, the early 1990s, uh, but I hadn't looked at the data for some time, courtesy of being caught up in another little battle inside economics disputing the theory of the firm. So in 2005, December 2005, by sheer accident, I was asked to do a uh, expert witness case to fight a predatory loan, uh, to try to get that loan overturned on behalf of the uh, New South Wales Legal Aid Commission. And I wrote this throwaway line in a great rush to write my expert witness report saying debt to GDP ratios have been rising exponentially. And I thought, well, I can't get away with hyperbole because I'm not the barrister and the expert. So I've got to justify the word, and I probably won't be able to justify it. I'll need to attenuate it to something like rising, you know, regularly over time or whatever. And then I had, had to download data, which was quarterly for GDP, monthly for debt levels, write a few routines with to import the two. At 2 o'clock in the morning in Perth, I finished doing it, and the red line turned up. And I took one look at that and thought, holy hell, that's almost perfectly exponential from, from 1964 on. It can't continue. When it turns down, there'll be a huge financial crisis. Somebody has to raise the alarm, and I'm probably the somebody. Of course, I didn't have the New Zealand data then. That's a little squiggly line on top of it. So much to my interest, as I only found in the last couple of weeks, you had a higher rate of growth of debt and a higher level of uh, private debt to GDP than Australia, though I only have data going back to 1998. Now, that's what I, when I called the crisis, I was expecting a turnaround in the debt level to come. But I said the crisis would begin before you saw a downturn in debt, when the rate of growth of debt declined. This is the data now. Now, these are two countries that don't particularly think they suffer from the global financial crisis. Let's look at one that knows it did. This is America. Of course, as soon as I plotted the Australian data, I dived straight into the flow of funds to see what the American data looked like. It's not quite so obviously exponential, but it's pretty damn close to an exponential rate of growth of the ratio of debt to GDP from 1945 on. And now that what it looks like after the crisis, well, there's no argument over there that they've gone from rising debt to plunging debt, and the crisis has been caused by that turnaround in the rate of growth debt. Now, that puts me completely outside of conventional economists because they don't actually worry about the level of debt. But if you look globally, if it is a problem, then it's a hell of a problem. This is now putting Australia and America and New Zealand into perspective. And actually, the worst appears to be England in terms of the absolute ratio of, of ag aggregate private debt to GDP. And there's some reasons why England is now finding it can't get out of the crisis. Uh, the awareness of this actually turned up in the Treasury uh, budget speech for 2010. And then was rapidly removed in 2011 and 2012. The data I'm using here is actually the Treasury's data from the 2010 budget uh, carried forward. So intriguing to see why the uh, Treasury economists were told not to write that for the uh, next two of speeches. Now, looking back in the longer term, and I've slowly acquired more data as time has gone on, this is courtesy of a very good research paper by the Australian Reserve Bank uh, by two, uh, two of their staff economists, Fisher and Kent, written I think back in 1999, uh, called A Tale of Two uh, Depressions, comparing the 1890s depression to the 1930s and saying that the crisis was worse for Australia in the 1890s and relating it directly to the level of debt, the private debt. And then I've actually extrapolated, but then added on, of course, the more recent data. And if they had a problem back then, well, what have we got now? This is still, you know, a country that doesn't think it suffered from the global financial crisis. Now, the trouble is for a conventional economics, 
is that most economists grew up in that time period and they had a 20 year period of stable growth to GDP, uh, debt to GDP. You can see that first 20 years after the Second World War there was no particular trend, which is the way it should be in my opinion. And then this exponential rate of growth of debt since that period. Now, if you're fitting economic models to that data and you don't believe debt is, has any function, but you're wrong, then when the debt turns around, suddenly those models that work so well will fail abjectly. And that's precisely what I think happened to economics, not just here in Australia, but also, of course, in America. Because again, the long-term view for America, I've now caught it courtesy of Morgan Stanley, Gerard Minak in, in Sydney, first published this chart and he's a good mate so I twisted his arm to send me the data. You'll now see this turning up all over the web and that uses the US Census data to go back to 1920 and then add on to the data that the flow of funds has been recording since 1952 to show the ratio of debt to GDP and as you can see the only other time which compares to the debt level we've got now is the Great Depression and recently Morris Schillerich who's working with uh, I've forgotten his first name, but Thomas, who's actually published an NBER research paper just in the last few days about the role of debt in crises over the longer term. Morris and Thomas together have been putting together, it's very much worth taking the reference down, worth looking at. They've put together a database going back 100, either 160 years across 14 countries or 140 years across 16 countries. I keep on getting the figures mixed on that front. And they said this, over that time period, this is the biggest debt bubble recorded over one and a half centuries. So we're, and where they have data going back up to 500 years in countries like England, they say there's been nothing like it in the last half millennium. So almost certainly we're living through the biggest debt bubble in human history. And yet we ignored the role of private debt all the way through. And again, this is when conventional economists grew up. They had no idea what was going to happen when this struck and they still really haven't comprehended what's going on and why. So I think you can only understand this crisis by looking at the dynamics of debt. Because when you look at the decline in income, it certainly happened for America. But yes, it was bad, but it certainly wasn't severe enough to explain why this crisis is continuing and why it's hit so suddenly. The dotted line you can see there, Mark BNP, is the Banque Nationale de Paris. That's the day on August the 9th of 2007, so over five years ago now, that that bank shut down five funds it had, which were, three, sorry, three funds, which were exposed to the American subprime crisis. They could no longer value them. These were AAA. Remember that? AAA? I wonder what the A's stand for. Uh, you know, AAA rated the bonds they could no longer rate. They shut them down and the credit crunch began from that day. Now, of course, the, the downturn begins you know, almost a couple of years later. It's rather hard to work it out until you add in, which I'm now going to do, add the change in private debt on top of GDP. Because I define aggregate demand in the economy as the sum of income which is like roughly GDP, plus the change in debt. So that's what you get. And now you can see the turnaround in the rate of growth of debt occurred very shortly after the BNP crisis. Pardon? Oh, yeah. Just what you need, feedback. That's, had, that's probably somebody's phone going off, most likely mine. I hate this, but you know, find the same thing. You've got one of these phones and then you get an email message and bang, it rings your, it rings your uh, microphone. And it's now turning my mobile off. Isn't it terrible? The presenter hasn't turned his, mic turned his phone off. Okay. That's the, that's, that's the real story. And I have to explain why I worry about that. Because conventional economists completely ignore private debt. And they have two theoretical reasons behind it. One is, of course, the asset market argument for the efficient markets hypothesis that the gearing of either a firm or investors are relevant because firms are valued on the basis of their expected future earnings discounted uh, at the rate of interest. And at the individual level, of course, you don't want to have Ponzi schemes happening. Therefore, let's assume they don't. And that's a great assumption to make after the financial crisis, isn't it? And macro macroeconomics, the model they have of how money is created is known as the loanable funds model, which really sees banks as just intermediaries between savers and borrowers. So an increase in debt just represents that savers have put more money onto the market to be borrowed by borrowers, it hasn't actually changed the amount of money and the turnover all that much. Now all these notions are based on a priori reasoning, armchair logic, the Jeremy Bentham way of thinking about the world, sit in an armchair and work out what level of penalty is likely to stop people stealing bananas. And I'm joking about the bananas, but not about the way Bentham first worked out the punishments he thought that would control crime in England. <laughs> 
And here's some examples of that sort of reasoning after the crisis. These are three papers. I, thought, I knew I could find them. I went searching to find uh, academic papers that assume no Ponzi behaviour as part of their logic, written after the financial crisis. This is a course in macroeconomics. Uh, just bring that up and show it to you quickly. Okay. November 2001, Complete Markets. You go to page 31. Let's see. I'll pay. I'll just blast. Pardon. Don't worry about the equations passing through here. There must be a no Ponzi game condition. Well, that's nice. Let's assume away Bernie Madoff. We don't need to jail him. We just need to assume he doesn't exist. Simple. And again, the same. You check the pages in those other papers. The same sort of story. I'm sorry, you can't assume away what caused the crisis and then attempt to explain the crisis. And of course, if you have a model in which nothing can go wrong, then nothing is going to go wrong in your model, but your model won't fit the real world. And the ultimate objective should be to fit at least the qualitative behaviour of the real world. I think the ambition of predicting its quantitative scale is, at the economics at the moment, a, a, a vain ambition. But to get the qualitative behaviour right of what we should be aiming for. So when I look at work like that, I can't help but thinking of the way Keynes described Hayek back when he was having their battles, you know, see satirised on YouTube these days, was saying how, how Hayek's work was an extraordinary example of how starting with a mistake, a remorseless logician can end up in bedlam. And I think that's what's happened with the neoclassical economics. By starting with a set of notions which are wrong and then building a theory on top of them, they've built an elaborate, uh, intricate, well-developed theory which is wrong. We need one which is right. And I start from the work of Schumpeter and Minsky in particular, in which private debt plays an essential role. And the fundamental role of, of debt in Schumpeter's vision of a well-functioning capitalist economy, I better emphasise that because I got a post, a comment on my blog today saying how you know, that's not at all how banks actually behave. They want you know collateral backing and they're into financing asset bubbles. They don't behave like Schumpeter says at all. And I then quoted from my post saying, in a well-functioning well capitalist economy. So this is Schumpeter's vision of a well-functioning economy and Minsky building on top of that to, to build a, th a theoretical basis for how the role of debt adds to aggregate demand, but also, of course, noting the bad bit, that debt can funds out finance Ponzi behaviour as well as financing entrepreneurial activity. And in both cases, you get the argument coming out of both authors that rising levels of debt add to aggregate demand. And that sounds like double counting to the you know, neoclassical remorseless uh, logicians. I'll show that it's not. Uh, but for now, I'll just go through and explain how Schumpeter sees debt playing a role, a functional role in a capitalist economy. And his point of view is starts from the process, explaining the process of change, and says that development in a capitalist economy involves taking existing assets and using them in a different way. And he said, with that proposition, you end up with, directly end up with a heresy and notice he said it's a heresy, writing back then, this is 80 years ago, the heresy that money and means of payment perform an essential function, and therefore that what's going on as money is not just the mirror image of what's happening with goods, which is the neoclassical vision. And he said, in every, and look, at this, this is, I, I, I identify with this so strongly, because I'm still getting these arguments myself when I put the proposition to neoclassical that money matters. In every possible strain, with rare unanimity, even with impatience and moral and intellectual indignation, and believe me, I've seen it in bucket loads, a very long line of theorists assured us of the opposite. But he then says, since they're wrong, since this proposition is, is correct in the real world, in real life, total credit must be greater than it would be if it was fully covered. Now, Schumpeter is a good one for confusing terminology on occasions. By fully covered credit, what he means is demand that's financed by selling existing goods and services. By total credit, he means that plus that plus the amount of, of purchasing that's financed by new debt. And he argues that credit is more than just previously saved income. So he said credit is not a case of you know, what you save and put uh, and then put aside and don't spend. He said it is actually money created ad hoc not backed by goods and services in the already in existence. And he says, credit is essentially the creation of purchasing power for the purpose of transferring it to the entrepreneur, but not simply the transfer of existing purchasing power. And he says, where does it come from? He says, well, the conventional argument is it's saved, part of income that's not spent. Now, I must emphasize here, it's not just neoclassical economists who don't get this. I'm still having to persuade 
one of my favourite fellow post-Keynesians about this argument. It's so easy to fall into this proposition. So it, it is, and I'll explain why we fall into the proposition and believe it's logical and have data to back us in the belief that it's logical later on in the presentation. But Schumpeter says it's not thrift that actually gives rise to that. He said if it were just not spending current income and therefore giving it to somebody else to spend, which would reduce our own demand, he said, well, there'll be less, it's not a particularly rich source, that, that, that's a small fraction of what's actually available, and there'd be less incentive to do it anyway. He said, so the conventional answer is not obviously absurd. In other words, the, the, the conventional wisdom that he's fighting, was fighting then and I'm fighting today, is not obviously absurd. He said, but there's another means of attaining it, which because it doesn't rely upon what's been accumulated previously and has more independence, you can regard it as really the, strictly the only one in existence, and that's the method of, of creating a purchasing power by banks. He said it's not transforming existing power, not handing money over from savers to borrowers, but the creation of new purchasing power out of nothing. Now, often when you see those comments made, you'll see somebody like Paul Krugman describe that as being said by a banking mystic or an economic crank, etc., etc. Even today, no neoclassical economist is going to describe Schumpeter as a crank. I'm sorry. It's beyond that level of description by a substantial margin. So his logic goes that he started off by accepting that Volra's law described an economy in equilibrium. So he actually admired Volra, he admired mathematical uh, thinkers, didn't know the flaws in Volra's logic were since established, but he admired them. And he said that describes an economy in equilibrium. But in equilibrium, uh, with the neoclassical theory of distribution, all profits are zero. If you see where is the entrepreneur going to make any money, well the answer is he's not because you know, the wage is the marginal product of labor, the rate of profit is the marginal product of capital. When you multiply those by the you know, resources used and under the assumption of constant returns to scale, which is necessary, otherwise stuff either appears out of thin air or disappears into the ether, uh, then production is pro essentially profitless. So he's aware of the problem. There is no profit in that model. So he said you're describing a, a static equilibrium, a state of rest, ignoring the process of change. But he said you have to look at the process of change and for him, accepting there's no profit in equilibrium, it's through the process of change that profit occurs. So he said you have a theory which can't understand profit. And so that's an essential flaw in how well you can apply this model to the real world. So you have to have a theory of discontinuous change where the entrepreneur plays an essential role. So we've got a theory describing life from the point of view of the tendency towards an equilibrium. It lets us describe what prices and quantities are now, and it's added into existing data, but they f this, these tools fail when data changes by fits and starts. So you can't predict what's going to happen courtesy of discontinuous change. And you can't explain where revolutions in production come from. You can only talk about what's happened after all that's occurred. So it's, it's time, sh time snap analysis. It's not the analysis of actual change. So he builds a model that starts off with accepting Volra's vision, and then adds qualitative change to it and explains profit as coming out of one of five types of qualitative change. So introduction of a new good, a new method of production, opening up a new market, a new source of raw materials, or the one that I don't agree with, which is normally because it doesn't work, reorganizing existing industry. Normally that's you know, mergers and acquisitions are normally net negative processes, but the first four I, I certainly accept. And he says how these, given those those activities, you can generate a profit and what you are experiencing cannot be described in an equilibrium way because there's no entrepreneurial activity in equilibrium. So the entrepreneur is the essential element of his thinking and the entrepreneur necessarily requires credit. I'll give you an example actually just required yesterday of an entrepreneur who's now living in this country who's actually invented FPOS. He told me the personal story behind that and how he got the, how he got the money, uh, which actually breaches uh, the vision that, uh, that, uh, that um, the direct vision that Schumpeter puts across here because it's actually easier to do it than Schumpeter sets it up in his own model. So his vision of an entrepreneur is somebody who has a good idea but no money to put it into practice. That's essentially how he defines an entrepreneur. And therefore, without money beforehand, he has to borrow it. So he can only become an entrepreneur by becoming a debtor in the first instance, and it's a necessity 
It's not an accidental thing. It has to happen. So before he can become an entrepreneur, he has to have credit. And he says he's the typical debtor in a capitalist society. Now, you can generalize that and say the typical debtor is normally the firm sector. We're actually living through an extraordinary period where the household has a larger level of debt. So he makes these simplifying assumptions, first of all, that all innovation is done by new firms, not by existing ones. Of course, we know firms like Apple innovate. And he said uh, it's not essential that, the, you know, that that happens, but that's often the case. And he also assumes that everything's fully employed. He's working in Volrath law, of course, so you've got to start from every market being in equilibrium, including the labour market. Now, that, that therefore means there are no idle resources lying around that you can take advantage of. Of course, in the real world, we know both those assumptions are breached. But what, he, oh, what happened there? Oh, I hit B by accident. Warning to everybody, do not hit B when you're typing a presentation. It's the shorthand cut for blank the screen. Okay. Now, he's, he's, he's saying that as a rule, you've got to draw the resources from that are currently working. So you don't often get an unemployed computer programmer to come along and, and do the work for you to develop a new app, even though there are plenty of them around. You normally take somebody who's employed, who's got a track record, and steal them from another firm. This is the sort of point that he's making. So the assumptions he's made there, I think it's the right way to use assumptions, because he's actually made his case harder. He's clarified the situation and said, yes, there are entrepreneurs who have money and those without. Let's work out how those without get, you know, get ahead. And he's saying, yes, I know there's often unemployed resources. Let's assume there aren't any, which makes it harder, not easier, to prove the point he's making. That's very different to the way neoclassical assumptions are made. Have you heard the can opener joke, by the way, about economists? You haven't. Okay. I first heard this joke when I was, as a, I think I was 19 at the time. Now, hang on, was I 20? No, I was 20. And uh, my professor of economics was giving a talk at a, a careers day in my s suburb. And I went along just to make life miserable for him. It was my, my main activity back in those days. I brought my friends along. And uh, we sat through the present. We didn't do anything. We just sat there and asked questions. Yeah. Well, he saw him in the audience. He was absolutely angry that I was there. And it had to be explained that I actually lived in the suburb. So he couldn't say I had no right to be in the room. The other speaker was Sir Philip Baxter, who was the then the pre, uh, chair of... University of New South Wales, but he was the guy, of course, brought in the nuclear power uh, institute in the Lucas Heights in Australia, so he was the proponent of nuclear power. And Baxter gave a speech talking about industrialization, economies of scale. One of his lines was, you can have any car you like as long as it's white, and economies of scale were vital. And then uh, Simkin gave a talk talking about efficiency, competition, etc., etc. And I asked the two to compare each other's speeches. And Baxter, you know, just jumped up and immediately told this joke. He said, there's a physicist, a chemist, and an economist who get wrecked on a desert island. And all they've got with them is a container load of baked beans that's washed up, nothing else to eat. And the chemist says, well, if we go to some of those palm fronds over there, I can set them alight, and we can then make the cans explode. And the physicist said, right, if you do that, I can calculate the trajectory of the beans, and we can go and get them. And the economist says, hang on, guys, you're making it far too difficult. Let's assume we have a can opener. You should have seen Simpkins' reaction to that when the joke was told. Anyway, so first stage is the, innovate, the, the, the entrepreneur needs uh, concepts and resources to put into effect but doesn't have them. So needs, he needs credit. The second stage, he gets the credit and he actually pretty much describes effectively banks as venture capitalists in this way of seeing things. And they, and they create the purchasing power by double entry effectively. And that's what finances the new combinations. So he sees the banker as the capitalist par excellence. Now, that was, could, be, could have been true across the 20s and 30s when Sean Pater was writing, or uh, well, the, the, the 10s and 20s. I think these days they've become the Ponzi merchant par excellence, which is a great tragedy. But, okay. So he says they're not, a, they're not a, a middleman between saver and borrower. They're actually the creator of this commodity called purchasing power. A very, very different vision of the role of banking. And rather than saying that, that people suffer from money illusion, effectively, Sean Plato is saying that banks play an essential role. And from my point of view, because neoclassical economists have convinced themselves that money doesn't matter, and then you model the economy as a barter system, which money is an afterthought, if at all, fundamentally they're suffering from barter illusion. The belief that you can model capitalism without having banks, debt and money as a fundamental part of it, I think is the illusion of believing we live in a barter economy, which we clearly don't, and by the looks of it from historical research, we really never have.
So then you purchase goods and services with those that money and generate some new product and you get a cost advantage over your incumbents. And Schumpeter goes through a number of ways in which that can work. Where well, you can get a surplus, which doesn't exist in equilibrium, because again, that's the whole idea in equilibrium, you're paying the full cost for everything under the neoclassical model of income distribution, there is no profit. So, so the new technologies are superior to the existing technologies, and therefore the receipts for this business will be greater than their total costs. So you see this example of the power loom, which was you know, the first major step in automating industry is to replace hand looms with power looms. And of course we can go back to a long, long way and look at a loom that looks like this. Uh, and the sweatshops we had lots of English women working in them, lousy wages, sleeping there, kids working there as well, pretty much the conditions of third world shops these days. And of course we now have more advanced machinery and a lot of it, as has now become obsolete, now it turns up in third world sweatshops. So the process goes on. Then you get high tech machines that we see today, you know, and, and tomorrow we could have clothing be made by biotech. It's that sort of transformation process going on all the time. Now, Schumpeter argues that if you see, uh, if somebody can envisage power looms and then borrows from a bank to create the business making them, and now when it hires a worker, that worker produces six times as much as a hand worker will, then under three conditions you'll make a surplus. The first is that you can't drive the price down so much when it, your, product, your technology comes online that you wipe out your advantage. Secondly, that you can't uh, pay more for the machine than the labour you've managed to displace or the technology you've displaced. And thirdly, that you uh, don't drive up the demand for the resources you're using more intensely. He said if that happens, you'll get a, a surplus of receipt over, uh, re receipts over outlays. So take an example where we got a power, you're working in hand loom days where it takes six workers each being paid $100 a day and they're using mach a machine that depreciates at $100 a day to do it. And then you come along with a new machine, you know, which you only need one worker for, and you've got twice the depreciation, but you drive up wages by $1 a day. So you have a $100 rise in your depreciation. You have a $1 rise in the labour of the one work you've now got left. And you drive down the prices by a dollar per day's output. So you're going to come out $398 a head. Now I'll give you, this is actually an example of... Uh, Francis and I heard yesterday speaking to, I won't, I won't mention William Mook, he gave a, the guy who actually apparently invented FPOS, who's now living in New Zealand. And he told the tale of uh, being a, a tinkerer and a computer designer. He worked out that he could actually use the electrical outputs at the back of a, a sales terminal to record what the sales terminal transactions actually were, which therefore displaces the need for clerks who were then writing all the stuff down from receipts to record it and transfer it across to a, a, a computer elsewhere. And he made these things in his mum's kitchen. And he'd make them on the weekend and then sell them to friends. And then DEC, back in the days when DEC sold a machine called the PDP-11, they were, were finding that people would, you know, this was every time they sold one of the, he sold one of these things, the person would then buy a DEC to take the data out the back. So they got approached by a DEC salesman saying, can you actually, you know, can we, you sell this to us rather than to the retailers? And having a business background in his family, he's sensible enough not to say, oh, well, they cost me 80 bucks, what do you want to pay for them? He said, oh, what do you reckon they're worth? And the guy said, oh, well, about $11,000. Did that sound all right? So he was, you know, <laughs> he, did, he, he managed not to explode. That's reasonable, sure. So he's making about $11,000 per circuit board on the weekends, far more than he was making... But that's, that's the sort of thing you're talking about. So it's not just a hypothetical example. Of course, in that particular case, DEC is then borrowing the money from the bank, effectively. Okay? So the circuit route by which the endogenous expansion of money locks in is different. But that's a fundamental example of an entrepreneur doing precisely that. But then, of course, as time went on, and literally this happened to him too, over time, more and more people thought, hell, if you can make that much money, out of, you know, then they worked out what does this device probably cost. They may have made it five or ten times more expensive than his version. But then, of course, ultimately that profit got driven out of the system over time. And, of course, we get to the stage we don't even think of what's involved in swiping our credit card and buying a commodity. But it all began back with that technology. And it, this is the nature of capitalism, it's always having those sorts of changes. So from that point of view as well, Schumpeter's argument is that the entrepreneurs both can pay back the debt well and truly. With profit margins like that, anybody can pay back the debt and retain a credit balance. But if also you've re enriched the the productive cycle. You've got a richer form of technology now in existence.
and it's cyclical. So once it actually happens, of course, then the people, once the technology is being produced, the technology that used to do the previous type of work is wiped out over time. So you, from going from causing a boom to causing a slump. So it's a cyclical process. It does not happen smoothly over time. And then you know, the, the surplus disappears that they've made, but then the process will begin again with another form of business. And you said, this whole fluctuation in the economy, he explains by the cyclical nature of this process. And it's necessarily discontinuous because, of course, an innovation has to come out of nowhere, effectively. Somebody has to dream it up. Then they do it, and bang, the new technology is there. So you're taking a new idea and producing it with existing technology, which is exactly what Mook did. You know, he, he didn't, all he had to do was combine circuit board pieces in a different way to make the device that could read the signals out of the uh, cash registers and then transfer them to a computer directly rather than through manual labour. So, of course, once that happens, people seeing the profit he's making, other entrepreneurs dive in and try to do it. They borrow money. So as well as expanding their own industry, they also expand the general economy because the money they're spending is additional money over and above what comes out of the circulation of goods. So you get this growth in the rate of growth of the economy coming out of it while the money is being spent in. And, uh, and you go beyond Say's law. You go beyond the argument that supply creates its own demand and is the entire explanation of demand. You've now got aggregate demand greater than aggregate supply, financed by credit as well as by selling existing goods. So you've got the fundamental argument I'm coming to that aggregate demand in a capitalist economy exceeds aggregate supply from goods and services alone. And it's an essential part of a capitalist economy. It doesn't happen in the circular flow, which is what, how Schumpeter describes standards production and sale of commodities. It's something which happens on top of that in the actual economy in a credit-driven system. So what it means is with the credit-driven system, entrepreneurs don't have to wait for people to save money to bring their innovations in. They don't have to go and work you know, in, a, in a bottle shop saving the money to go and buy their first circuit board, et cetera, et cetera. The gap is closed by the creation of money by the banking sector without them needing to be selling at existing commodities. And therefore, you've breached Say's law, you've breached Valrath's law. Demand exceeds receipts from current sales. And the difference is financed by debt. So again, it's hammering the point that the, the, the vision that neoclassical economics has, has built, which Schumpeter accepted as an adequate description of equilibrium, doesn't cover what happens in a growing economy. Which is why it's a very, very different vision of how capitalism functions. So this is the Say's law vision that he's talking about now. But entrepreneurial activity is also in existence. And we don't have a model of how the entrepreneur behaves in neoclassical economics. You add it in, you've got to include credit as well, which goes beyond the sale of goods and services. So demand exceeds supply in this vision, which therefore means, of course, inflation can occur because, again, he's working with the idea of a fully employed economy. Well, what you're then doing is you're driving up the cost of productive services from that model point of view. Of course, in the real world, it won't be quite so, so definite. That therefore means that you're going to have inflation coming out of the credit creation process. But rather than seeing inflation as necessarily a bad thing, he's saying it's an inevitable consequence of innovation. But then after it's happened, there's reasons for that inflation to become deflation again. Again, think of the 19th century. We had much more extreme cycles in inflation and deflation than we've had in the 20th century, thinking more in that, uh, that sort of pure capitalist period back then. So this inflation, first of all, isn't a bad thing. It's actually what it's a necessary side effect of expanding production courtesy of credit creation. And it, it goes into reverse when those goods are uh, then brought out and sold because now you have a technology which can undercut the existing technology. And therefore you get a tra transition from a boom to a slump. And Schumpeter actually calls what we now call recessions, he calls them depressions that cyclical process of credit expansion and contraction as entrepreneur ways of entrepreneurial behavior through the system is an essential part of his vision of how the economy functions. And the entrepreneur walks away with profit. So you have a view where money is essential, where you can't say supply equals demand or creates all demand. 
as in the neoclassical vision, and you don't have Walras law applying, you're out of equilibrium. It's not even a case of a transition from one point of disequilibrium to another, because again, even that's done with the vision of a set technology. We're talking a discontinuous change overall. So you have the argument that finance is essential for economic growth in a way that integrates economics and finance together, whereas neoclassical economics has always tried to treat them in two separate boxes. So the proposition is that aggregate demand is equal to income plus the change in debt. And as I said, it's not just neoclassical, so read that and accuse me of double counting. Because people say, well, this doesn't, once the money is borrowed, it doesn't become somebody's income. And I'm counting it therefore twice, once as income and once as the change in debt. And when you look at the records, things like the, na the National Income and Production Accounts and so on, if you sum up expenditure, it precisely equals income. One person's spending is another person's income. So it's true, but it's not inconsistent at the same time. And I'll go through the logic later, uh, but that's, that is, those two facts can be reconciled, which most people don't understand. And believe it, I didn't have a proper explanation until I started working with some mathematicians at the Fields Institute just in the last couple of months. So the explanation has satisfied me. I've now got one that's watertight in mathematical terms, so I'll go through it. Now, if I was wrong, of course, then there'd be no relationship between the change in debt and economic activity because all the change in debt would do is transfer spending power from borrower to saver and one's increase would be matched by the other's decrease pretty much except for a change in velocity or change in propensity to consume. Uh, or when you have the, what we've seen the special circumstances which the argument Krugman makes to try to explain the current crisis because he does argue that debt matters. We actually were both asked to write an article, a Dear George letter to the Chancellor in England by the Guardian and of the seven economists asked to write, we actually probably agreed on, on policy all the way down. Well, everybody except for Ken Rogoff argued for deficit spending rather than austerity and in addition to that, Krugman and I both argued that private debt had to be reduced by policy. So um, there were ways in which we actually agree on a lot of points but the analysis is different. Is that annoying, that buzz there? I'm not sure if it's coming from... Can you put up with it? I can't. It's over there, is it? Okay. Okay. We might um, see if we can find out what's causing that. Yeah. Okay. Now, we had a bit of a blarney. Did anybody see this? This, this uh, I can't call it a debate, maybe a slanging match on the internet recently? Yeah. Yeah. So Krugman read a paper of mine and started off rather rather well, you know, in the sense that he's engaging with the argument. Then uh, it got rather toxic after that. One thing I have to thank him for is when I tell people who aren't economists that the economic theory has a macroeconomy modelled as if there are neither banks nor debt nor money, they think I've you know smoked something strange over the weekend. That can't possibly be true. Well, along comes Krugman and says, "Now I'm all for including banks, banking." the banking sector and stories where it's relevant, but why is it so crucial to a story about debt and leverage? Well, I don't need to assert it, I just quote Krugman, then they reckon he was off smoking the funny stuff on the weekend. So and then he's, he quite accurately describes my arguments from this point on saying that Keane asserts that lending is in addition to aggregate demand. He says, I don't get that at all. And I, one thing I have to thank him again for is a very clear writer. So often you read neoclassical economics, you basically, it's an experience like thinking you've gone to a, you know, a transcendental uh, Buddhist retreat where they spoke to you in Sanskrit. Um, it's very hard to understand what the hell they're saying, even without looking at the equations. But here you can re read them very clearly. For his vision of lending, if I decide to cut back on spending and stash the funds in a bank, which lends them out to someone else, this doesn't have to represent a net increase in demand. Yes, sometimes you know people who borrow have got a higher propensity to spend, uh, but I said Keynes seems to be saying something else, and I'm not sure what. He says, I think it has something to do with the notion that creating money equals creating demand, punchline. But again, that isn't right in any model I understand. That's perfectly correct all the way down, including the last statement. And he's, but he says debt does matter. Krugman's explanation is that debt does matter, not in general, but because we're in a liquidity trap right now. And again, his description of this is very clear. He really does put his, his mental, uh, verb, mental model down well in words, which again, I, I have to thank him for that. So he had a period of too much optimism about debt, in which debt has borrowed too much and spent too much. Then he says, since one person's debt is another person's asset, to actually get that increase in debt, 
uh, creditors, people who save, had to be encouraged to spend less via higher interest rates. So he's arguing a link between the level of real level of, of debt creation and the level of interest rates. So then people remember the dangers of debt. We move from leveraging to deleveraging, but it's not symmetric because you can't get real interest rates low enough to induce sufficient spending by those who aren't in debt. Now his vision there is that the spenders, the borrowers, are borrowing money and spending. The savers are spending less than their income and, and not spending that bit. Then the, bo the borrowers become savers. So what you really need for is a swap in roles. You need people who used to be used to be savers to now become net spenders to balance the change. But he said to do that, you've got to drive interest rates below zero, which you can't do. Again, I press the B key. Pardon me. Okay. So he said one way to explain our depression is that debtors are trying to do lever too fast, and that's an argument in favour of fiscal, poli fiscal policy to counteract their deleveraging by if, the, if you can't get the savers to do the spending, then you get the government to do it instead. Okay? So quite, it's a simple, logical argument starting from an initial assumption, which I'm now going to take a look at. So it argues that the distribution of debt is the only problem, not the level of debt. Don't need to worry about the stats I showed you beforehand, the fact that debt coincided with three of the last three depressions in Australia and two of the last two in America is just coincidence. Uh, so you can end the recession by a large enough government deficit or by raising the inflation level. And that's why his book has got this punchline at the end entitled, End This Depression Now. Because the emphasis is, it's just a gratuitous depression. If we simply got savers to, to, to start spending, or the government did the spending, or we could cause inflation, we'd be out of it straight away. We could end it very quickly and very easily. And we need more government spending, of course, to fill up the gap. And that would get us out of the problem. And it's just a it's snap your fingers and it's over type stuff. You know, abracadabra, wake up and the problem is gone. Now, I agree with the need for deficits, but not the diocese. So I'll go show, through, show why. Because he's actually given us two testable hypotheses here. This was suggested to me by Matthias Grisselli, who's the mathematician I'm working with at the Fields Institute. First of all, he's proposed that high interest rates are correlated with high rate, real, high real growth rates of the level of debt, so debt deflated by the CPI. And secondly, that the change in debt will have a macroeconomic impact after a liquidity trap, but won't have an impact beforehand. So let's look at the first one. This is the data for the real interest rate and the real change in debt. And there is a correlation there, as you can visually see. Uh, and the, the point I've got down here is the point at which the Federal Reserve cut the rate to 0.125%, which means from that point on, you should find a correlation in the second bit of data between change in debt and economic activity. Now, the correlation with the change in the, the high, high real interest rates and high rate of growth of debt is fairly reasonable, 0.46 between 1980 and, and today. It's stronger after the zero lower bound, which is strange, okay? because we're now talking, in effect, as you can see, given the inflation rate, at least the reserve bank's rate is negative and not the rates we face for commercial borrowers because commercial rates are at least 3% higher than the rates set by the Federal Reserve. So they're still positive real interest rates, but this is the reserve rate itself. But it's actually, the correlation's weak beforehand. So I'd say that's, that's a weakly confirmed hypothesis, not when I'd go, you know, jumping over in the moon and dancing about the correlation. It's, uh, it's there, but it's not patent. This is the important one. The change in debt only has macroeconomic impacts in a liquidity trap. Now, what I'm showing here is the unemployment rate turned upside down, just to make the clarification easier, uh, because I'm talking, there's a negative correlation in the data, and Krugman would agree there'd be a negative correlation. Low change of debt after the zero lower bound uh, increase in unemployment. So there's zero unemployment, there's 12% down there. Now, I think I don't, you can, not, you can see already that the point I'm making is going to be pretty obvious, because Krugman's hypothesis is I should find a strong correlation on that side of the zero lower bound but no real correlation on the right-hand side, only enough to be statistically insignificant. Now, you can see the correlation is there, but it's actually weak after the, after the zero lower bound. It's stronger over the entire time period, and it's strongest before the zero lower bound, which is a good, very good reason to reject his hypothesis. So the change in debt matters at all times. And therefore, you've got an argument, which is to coin a phrase from mention that great English, American humorist, uh, satirist back in the early 19, 1900s, that the neoclassical theory, it's, it's neat, it's plausible, and it's wrong. 
And as Huxley once said, the great tragedy of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. Well, you know, let's, let's, we should have more of that in economics. We need more ugly in economics. So I'm going to go through the alternative empirically deduced hypothesis now that change in debt matters at all times because it adds to aggregate demand. Still not explaining why. Uh, and it's partially confirmed by what I've shown you beforehand, but to really do it properly, what I've got to look at is not the percentage change in debt on an annual basis, which is what that data was, but the change in debt relative to GDP. Because if you look back, uh, because there's been a trend, obviously, to the ratio of debt to income. So back in 1970, if there'd been a 10% change in the level of debt, in my theory, that would have been a 10% change in debt finance demand. By 2009, the debt level was three times as high. So a 10% change in debt was the 30% addition to aggregate demand. So I've got to modify it and weight it by the change in by GDP rather than on its own basis. This is to make that case. This is the ratio of debt to GDP over time in America. And you can see how it's gone from being you know 45% over here up to 300% by the peak. So back here in the 1960s, a 10% change in the level of debt was, a 10 was also 10% worth of GDP. But you fast forward to here, it's still pretty much the same percentage rate of growth of debt. Notice that it's actually fairly constant, it cycles, but it's got a pretty average of about the 10 to 15% level all the way through. But as a percentage of GDP at the peak, it was about 30% of GDP versus a 10% change. So I'm now reweighting that previous data by GDP. And this is the correlation I get. And that's over a 30-year period. Okay? People say correlation is in causation. Yes, true. But if I get a correlation like that over boom and bust, the, the range of economic circumstances we've been through, it's telling you something you bloody well better listen. So the correlation is strong after the zero lower bound, very strong between 1980 and now, 1980 and now, and again before the zero lower bound strike, stronger still. So there's very strong empirical support for the proposition that change in debt is for aggregate demand. And if you sum it, this is just a statistical summary of the, of the table there. So the empirical result is very powerful. And the way we should work in economics is the way sciences work, and that's try to explain the empirical data. So we need an alternative hypothesis that makes sense of that. And there has been one for at least the last 40 years, which is that the money supply is endogenous. The money supply is not controlled by the central bank, and doesn't just reflect what happens in goods and services, but it involves the creation of new spending power by the banking sector. So that aggregate demand equals incomes we've earned, we've earned plus the change in spending power created by the banking sector. And the model that Krugman has of money, of how the banks actually operate, again, is plausible but wrong. And that model has the idea that a patient agent lends to an impatient. I find the terms that neoclassical economists use to describe banking childish patient, impatient, and stuff like that. And pejorative as well. The buyer is impatient. Who do you think is a better person, the patient person or the impatient person? You know, There's always ways pejorative concepts turn up in what's supposed to be a neutral language. That's the vision of lending. The patient person's lending spending power goes down, the impatient rises, and you, the, the, the impatient might spend more out of that money than the, or more rapidly than the patient person does, but in the overall you can say no, no important change in spending power and the banks are just an intermediary, you can ignore them. That's the basic vision. Now this would appear like so in the books of a bank in that case and show using plus because the, the way accountants show it, it's a, it's a, it's a, you're, you're debiting one account and crediting another uh, and because you're looking at the liabilities of the banking sector, the patient's uh, accounts risen and therefore the liability of the banking sector have risen there, but they've been balanced by a fall in the liability they have to, to the patient person, and there's no change in the money supply out of that. Now, if I show the post-Keynesian vision, it's this way. It's saying the bank creates a loan and matches it with a deposit in the process, and the money supply therefore grows by the amount of the loan. And one thing I've been tr trying to do, as, as well as critiquing conventional economic theory, is develop, not just develop an alternative, but develop a means by which it can be modelled and communicated. So with the help of a grant from the Institute for New, New Economic Thinking, I'm having a software package built that enables me to model capitalism as a monetary phenomenon. And it can mo model even Krugman's vision. It's not a case that has to be the post-Keynesian. You can actually set up what the neoclassical vision is there. So I'll show you Krugman's model 
of loanable funds. And here I have a bank where the first part of the Act, as Krugman says, is I take the, the patient person stashes the money in the bank. So the patient person has a, a liability for the bank matched by the asset of, asset of the cash they put inside the bank. Then the patient person lends to the impatient. Now, I've then fleshed out the rest of the model. Well, having lent money, you've got to pay interest. So there's interest paid from the impatient person back to the patient. And now I'm guessing it's rather hard to read that text. Can you just, just make it out? Okay. Um, then what I'm presuming is the impatient person is actually an entrepreneur, wants to hire workers to produce in a factory somewhere, so he pays the workers' wages. And the workers then consume, and the patient agent who's making money by the interest, of course, also consumes. So put that all together and give some basic ideas for it. So obviously interest payments are the rate of interest on the amount of money that's been lent to the impatient person. And I've then got spending by the, the bank, uh, by workers, uh, what's being spent on workers' is wages being their share of the turnover of the economy, consumption by workers reflecting what they've got in their bank accounts, consumption by patient reflecting the same thing. I then simulate that, and this is now, because the impatient person is actually the, the firm sector, then the money passing through the firm sector is GDP. That's aggregate demand. So I simulate that, and I get the result Krugman expects. The amount of money in the patient account goes down, the impatient person account goes up, workers get a bit of money as well, and aggregate demand is constant. No change for the Lending Act. It reaches an equilibrium level, and then it stays at that level, and if I change the lending, I'd fall back to that same... I'd vary the equilibrium level a bit, but there'd be no exponential growth going on. So that's Krugman's model. Now, the model I've got for the, and this is probably better to show it here, the model for the endogenous money camp is to say the banking sector creates a loan and creates a deposit simultaneously. That's the initial condition. It then lends to the impatient agent, which is the firm sector. The firm sector then pays interest to the bank, not to the patient agent. The bank consumes, which can be you know, buying intermediate goods as well as actual consumption, Rolls Royces is, and, and teller machines as well as Rolls Royces. The impatient agent, the firm sector, pays wages. The workers consume. The impatient agent pays dividends to the patient. I'm presuming the patient is now actually the capitalist class that owns the factories. They consume, and there's then repayment of debt by the banking sector. So I simulate that with very similar uh, parameters, only adding in a couple extra for the, for the, uh, the bank relationship. So I get a larger system now. Now I then simulate this one. Again, the same definition for aggregate demand, and what I get there is change. So that's the difference. It gives you a very different vision of the macroeconomy, bringing up endogenous money. And of course, if I vary parameters, I'll change the rate at which growth occurs and so on. Uh, it's still a balanced model. All the accounting rules are applied in terms of uh, the balance, as you can see by the row sums here. One thing the software package does is make sure you don't make any uh, arithmetic mistakes in your uh, dynamics. So it shows that the neoclassical vision says banking is irrelevant, no need to worry about it in macroeconomics. The post-Keynesian says aggregate demand grows as debt grows, you've got to include banks, debt and money to understand capitalism. That's why it matters so much. Now, then the question is, well, who's right empirically? Well, I've showed empirical data to support me, but you can also find what central bankers have been trying to tell neoclassical economists, some, some central bankers, not all, uh, for, for decades. And my favourite was Alan Holmes, who, at the time he said this, was one step down from Bernanke in the banking sector in America, the vice president of the New York Fed. And he was trying to stop the experiment with monetarism. He said, from a practical point of view, knowing how banking actually operates, it can't possibly work. And as part of it, he said this lovely punchline, in the real world, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process, and look for the reserves later. Whereas the, the idea that Milton Friedman had was that banks lend from reserves, and therefore if the government controls the rate of growth. Yeah, I'd like to see a shaking head back there. It's accounting, it's in the accounting sense, it's not even possible to do that, but that's the vision they have. So, you, and, and of course, it's a common vision we all share because that's just become the simplistic way everybody who hasn't studied it deeply thinks about banking. So he said the idea of reject, regular injection of reserves controlling the growth of the money supply suffers from a naive assumption that the bank only expands loans after the system or market factors will put reserves in the banking sector. He said, in fact, the reserves, that the, the reserves themselves are based on 
delivered the deposits two weeks earlier. So rather than being a control mechanism, they're actually a measurement mechanism where it's not the, it's the banks who need the reserves to lend, it's the Federal Reserve who has to create the reserves to match what the banks have already done. And notice a two-week lag then, that's back in 1969. And we all know about the tremendous progress of computers since then, you know. What do you reckon the lag is now? Pardon? Two days, two days. A month. Bugger technology, the bankers have bent the, bank, the, the reserve over, the, over backwards and got themselves a month to find the reserves now. Where they're required to find the reserves, in fact, in most, most countries, they're not required to find the reserves. Even in America where they are, there's an excellent paper by O'Brien uh, writing in the Federal Reserve looking at, at reserve requirements across the OECD. Now, from memory, I think six of the 20 don't have reserve requirements anymore, including Australia. America still has reserve requirements, but there's one month lagged and it's only on household deposits. They're required to keep 10% of the amount of money that they have as household deposits, which I think is pretty much saying they want cash in hand in case there's a bank run. When you actually work through the amount of M2 that is actually uh, subject to reserve requirements, it works out to being about 2% of M2. And there's a new paper again by Carpenter and Demel Rapp, again writing for the Federal Reserve, saying on the basis of that, does the money multiplier actually exist? Whereas that's the conventional model, of course. So central banks, good researchers and people with a good empirical feel inside the bank have been trying to tell the, uh, the economics profession for decades that the, the model they've got is wrong. Now, the latest I've found, of all things, is the European Central Bank. Again, not a place that I thought I'd be bringing out progressive analysis here, but here's the ECB writing in May 2002, the May 2012 bulletin of the European Central Bank. It says the ECB's reserve requirements are backward-looking. That is, they depend on the stock of deposits subject to reserve requirements as it stood in the previous period, and here's the punchline, and thus after banks have extended the credit demanded by their customers. So the vision of the banking as endogenous is written through people with practical knowledge of how the banking sector operates. But of course, what would they know? That's only practical. The typical neoclassical question, yes, it works in practice, but does it work in theory? Well, here's a theory for you. This is Paul Krugman at the end of our debate, just before he declared victory and walked away, um, saying what he thinks is actually the control, because the SOK has heard the stuff that banks can create credit out of thin air, but that's all wrong. One of his favourite terms, you ever read his writing? That's all wrong, one of his favourite sayings. He so says, first of all, yes, an individual bank has to lend out what it receives in deposits. Intriguing. But the usual claim says, well, that's true of the individual banks, but it's the, it's the money's then deposited in another bank and the system as a whole isn't constrained by reserves. So, well, that sounds more like it, but that's also all wrong. He says, yes, a loan's deposited in another bank. Now, here we go. I love this bit. But the recipient can and sometimes does withdraw the money as currency. He said, and currency's in limited supply with the limits set by Fed decisions. So there's no automatic process. You know, the amount of cash will stop the lending. Now, I thought, well, you've got to write a movie about this. You know. So here's my one, one potential script. Paul's would read, the Bash cash manager looked at the ATM and says, hey, lending office, we're running out of cash. Stop lending. And they say, yes, sir. And the central bank employee rushes off to the governor, you know, the, the, the central bank, the ATM's running out of money, sir. And he says, don't worry, the banks will stop lending, not a problem. My script goes like this. The cash manager goes up and says, hey, lending office, stop running, we're, we're running out of cash. And they say, screw you, buddy, get off our floor. And the central bank employee rushes up to the governor and says they're running out of cash. And the governor goes, what? There's a run on the banks? Get cash down there in truckloads straight away. Which one do you think is more realistic? Yeah. To actually propose that as a, as a control mechanism shows that I think Paul's getting desperate in the discussion. It's no wonder he declared victory and went away. So you also find, again, the empirical data continues supporting this case, that aggregate demand is financed by a change in aggregate debt levels. And again, one thing I find remarkable in the literature is you'll find when neoclassical economists just look at the data and analyse it with intelligence, they find results that are contradict neoclassical theory, but they then keep on going with the theory. And here's one of my favourites. This is Famer in French. Now, these two guys, Famer in particular, was the leading um, you know, stormtrooper in intellectual terms for the efficient markets hypothesis. He didn't develop it first of all. That was sharp. But he was the one who really hammered it home and saying, in his first paper on it, which is where he began to get his, his fame in the, in the uh, literature, he said it's a good first and second approximation. 
to the data, meaning it gets both the level and the rate of change of asset prices, and therefore very, very reliable. In 2004, by the way, he said it empirically can't be trusted and should be rejected, but he still believes it. Remarkable to see how that happens. Back in 1999, he and French took a look at the CompuStat database of American corporations, looking at the, you know, the, it's the database that contains the annual reports of American companies and tells you what they've done in terms of new share issue, new debt, et cetera, et cetera, and new investment. And then we did a correlation of investment to the level of retained earnings, new equity issues, and new debt. And the punchline was the source of financing most correlated with aggregate financing, with aggregate investment, was long-term debt, finding a correlation of about 0.8. He said the correlations show that debt plays a key role in accommodating year-on-year -year variations in investment. So what he's fundamentally saying is the change in debt is investment minus profits, which is the equation that I used to model Minsky some years, some years earlier. Now, again, staunch neoclassicals here, looking at the timing of economic data. And if the money multiplier argument was correct, then changes in base money would precede changes in credit money. Because the idea goes, you can't actually, if you're reserve constrained, you can't lend until you get excess deposits. You get the excess deposit, then you can lend, but one precedes the other. So changes in M0 would precede changes in M1 and M2. And in fact, they found that the difference between M2 and M1 leads the cycle by about three quarters, whereas M0 follows it by about one quarter. So the timing is just completely wrong for arguing that the money supply is controlled by base money. And they finished with the observation that introducing credit, money and credit into growth theory uh, is an important open problem in economics, which I completely agree with. Only these guys got the Nobel Prize for developing real business cycle theory, in which banks' credit money plays absolutely no role. And they continue to develop the same theories after they found that empirical data. So the real process we're looking at is more like this. Rather than being patient lending to impatient, it's an entrepreneur approaching a bank saying, I've got a great idea, and the bank says, yeah, we like the idea, here's a million dollars, by the way, you owe us a million dollars simultaneously creating both the deposit and the loan. Again, the point that Helen Holmes made some years ago, and therefore putting additional spending power into circulation so that aggregate demand exceeds demand from income alone. So we have to include the role of change of debt in macroeconomics. Now, of course, I continue getting the double counting accusation. So the basic observation, starting right back at Schumpeter, is that the change in debt finances entrepreneurs and gives them spending power they don't get out of selling goods and services or taking money off people who are saving. So therefore, in the case of investment, it can exceed retained earnings. It can also be less than retained earnings. Aggregate consumption can also exceed distributed income, wages and distributed profits. It can also be less than it. And aggregate speculation will end up being financed by debt. So to prove this stuff, and pardon me, I know it's a bit early in the, early in the week for mathematics, but you're going to get some, so brace yourselves. So if I define income as wages plus profits, all profit will you can ultimately classify what people earn as either wages or profits, and divide profits into profits that are distributed through dividends and profits that are retained by the firm. So I've now said you've got income being wages plus distributed profits plus retained earnings. And expenditure is going to be spent either buying consumer goods or capital goods. I'm looking at the expenditure definition of GDP here. So you can ultimately say everything that's bought is either going to be a consumer good or an investment good. And looking at demand for consumer goods, it's going to come from workers and capital. So I'm ignoring that firms do buy some consumer goods. I'm looking at the classifying by the function in this case. So consumer spending is going to be wages plus the change in consumer debt. And capitalist spending is going to be profits, distributed profits, plus the change in, in capitalist debt. Now that can be negative. So I'm allowing for this. If it's, if it's negative, they're saving. They're spending less than their income. And the same thing for, for capitalists. That can also be negative. They borrow for consumption, but they can also... Pay, pay some of their debt down. So it's positive or negative. And the same thing for investment as well. You can get investment financed by either retained earnings or new debt. So that's the definition for investment. And borrowing by firms can be negative too. They can be paying their debt down as they're doing right now on a grand scale. So you've got the possibility of measuring either increase or decrease. The essential insight is that that's not loanable funds. So you don't have a zero there. Okay. Now, I compare the two equations. There's my expenditure equation, expanding out what that expenditure is all the way down. And let's rearrange. And now, in the first half, I've got income. 
And if I then subtract income from expenditure, I get a few cancellations. And the output is that expenditure is equal to income plus the change in debt. So that's the logic at that point. But it still sounds like double counting to the people. This is the one I showed to Mark Lavoie, and Mark still accused me of double counting. And I think this comes from the confusion that's been rife through economics for, for decades of consuming before the event with after the event, consuming ex post with ex ante. Because if you look at recorded income and expenditure, you will find they are identical even though they differ when you look at the point of view of how they're financed. And that's because debt is injected at discrete points in time. When you borrow money, if you go and swipe your credit card, that is an instantaneous injection of new money into the economy at the same time as the new debt is created. It adds to spending from that point of time. So if you measure it and look at what's happened, then the income of the person you bought the you know, new computer off will be equivalent to the change in debt. But looking from the point of view forehand, if you hadn't swiped the card, that person wouldn't have got the income. So it's that sort of clarification. So the recorded levels end up being the same. And I draw it in a picture here, and this is one Matthias Griselli grew for me, my uh, professor of mathematics friend at the Fields Institute, the deputy director there. So there we have income at time t. And there we have the change in debt, and that's expenditure at time t. That's the difference we're talking about. Now, when you're measuring income, what you're doing is looking backwards over time. So in a mathematician's term, I'll just move one of those graphics out of the way, what you're doing is looking at the integral in reverse, or looking at the limit, rather, of that function going backwards. That's the limit from above. This is a discontinuous function, which is economists are used to working with continuous functions. This is a function which has a break at a point. So we're now going to work with the mathematics of discontinuous functions. That means their limits differ. The limit from before is different to the limit after. So we're taking limit after, we're measuring, that's, we're looking at income from t from above. And that's going to be the limit of income as this s goes back towards t, where we're measuring coming in this direction. That's going to be identical to expenditure at time t. So expenditure at time t, which is shown up here, is going to be income at time t measured from above, which will be income at time t plus the change in debt. So that's the mathematical logic, but it goes one step further. I have to tell you a bit of a story about this. Matthias is a great personality. Uh, you don't get many mathematicians you'd actually could imagine could also do a line in stand-up comedy. Uh, he could. Some of his jokes are rather esoteric. I'll give you one of them he, he quite enjoys. It's, you know the recent story about uh, uh, whether they, they, they thought they discovered new trainers traveling faster than the speed of light? Okay, so this is a joke. The joke begins, I'm sorry, we don't, speed, speed, we don't serve faster than light neutrinos here. Two neutrinos walk into a bar. Yeah. Anyway, so his, he, he and I were having a meeting with the modern monetary uh, theory people in, at the Fields Institute back in July. And he and I worked, he actually proposed that using income and expenditure analysis to work out the logic for me. I didn't think it would go anywhere. I was humoring him, you know, saying, let's just get down and use the, the, the whole Fields Institute is covered in blackboards. So he's writing one in his blackboard. And, I thought this won't lead anywhere, and boy, was I wrong. That's where the equation came out. So Matthias derived that equation, which proved mathematically my point. We then had uh, Stephanie uh, Kelton and Scott Furwell come up for, and Michael Hudson for a lovely seminar to thrash out these areas of disagreement, and they instantly agreed with the whole proposition. But then Scott was talking about the period analysis that conventional uh, post Keynes economists normally do, where they treat time in discrete chunks. And Matthias walked home that day looking really troubled, trying to work out how the hell this period stuff fits together. And I thought, oh, no, don't tell me. This period disease, which I see as a real weakness of post-Keynesian economics, has hit him too. And I was really you know, quite concerned as he went off that night. Came back the next morning and chirply walks into my room and says, got something to show you. I offer to his room and he then shows me this little proof. That's the beginning of it. But the punchline comes here. He said, once you've actually looked at the logic like this, you then have a theorem from integration theory. Any mathematicians here? Okay. It's around what's called a Leberg integral, the way you actually do. Uh, the integration that you've been taught at school, if you were taught, is called Riemann integration. This is using a concept called Leberg integration, which is a more advanced concept. What you have is a flow of expenditure and income which coincide except for the discontinuity where the debt comes in. And if you therefore measure the integrals of those two functions, they are two functions which differ from each other only at a number, a finite number, 
of discrete points. And according to the rule of integration, if you integrate two functions which differ from each other only at a finite number of discrete points, the integrals will be identical. So if you use the national income and production accounts and go backwards to look and see what the results is, you'll always find expenditure precisely equals income. But you're missing the injections of debt because they're discrete. So there's a strong mathematical argument to support this proposition that aggregate demand is income plus the change in debt. In a sense, this is a bit like the quantum moment for, the, for neoclassical economics. We've gone from the Maxwell vision of everything in continuous time and continuous processes, everything's smooth, now we're looking at discrete injections and you get a different way of thinking about the economy. And it applies when you extend it to assets. So by now, what I, having changed the definition of aggregate income, aggregate demand, I've also got to change the definition of aggregate supply because it doesn't just include spending on goods and services, we also buy assets. So if you imagine that the capitalists you spend part of their distributed income on consumption and part on speculation, they can also borrow money to speculate. So what they spend on aggregate on assets will include distributed profits held used for speculation plus margin loans, change in debt. And when you go through, you get the same cancellations. So you've now got to integrate uh, finance and macroeconomics. You can't keep them separate because they're both financed by the change in debt. And that can, of course, be positive during a boom and negative during a crisis like it is now. Bring in government money creation, which, of course, you have to consider as an independent source of money as well. Then you're going to define expenditure as you know, consumption plus investment plus money spent on assets plus government spending minus government taxation. Well, we know the gap between the two is the change in government debt. You work the whole thing through and again you get the argument that the gap between expenditure and income is equal to in is the change in debt including government debt. So all these things are necessary consequences of thinking about the money supply in an endogenous function. If some expenditure is debt financed, and that in the loanable funds model is not correct, then aggregate demand differs from income. It's a necessary consequence. Once you have the other, you have to, one follows from the other. And I, I guess I said, I've said, I haven't yet convinced post-Keynesian economists of this. It's not just neoclassicals who get this one wrong. Okay. And surely Austrians as well are in the same camp. So we've got really to transform how we think about economics in total. And of course, there's now getting to the stage being brought in Minsky and rather brilliant assets, we're now talking about Minsky's work. And Minsky began as a mathematician. He did a mathematics degree before he did his PhD. And he tried to use mathematical logic initially and didn't get very far. Start because he was, when he was trained in mathematics, he didn't have the advantage of complexity theory and chaos theory, which existed after I started learning, before I started learning mathematics. Uh, but he tried to grapple with this whole issue of sectoral balances combined with debt having an integral role. He didn't get the maths worked out, but he did get the verbal logic right. So he said, if you have a closed economy, then you've got sectoral balances like this. And you can rewrite them as saying the sum of all those balances is zero. This is the large part of uh, the Wynne Godley tradition in post Keynesian economics. He said, the one's the gross surplus of the private sector, the other, the government surplus. Then he had another equation, which unfortunately, when I scanned it, I lost the bloody equation. I've got to go back home and, and find the original, the original book, which is on my shelves. I only located this while I was in New Zealand. So you're getting some new. A uh, new discovery by me. Equation three was his equation of surpluses for each sector. Now you notice here that's an ex post accounting identity. So he was aware of where the difference was coming from. You see, however, what we're observing are the plans of those sectors, which could be not necessarily consistent ex ante. Okay. But he said then they're resolved through the financial system, and therefore for aggregate demand to be increasing, what you need is this whole condition that our spending exceeds received income. Again, Matthias said you've got to emphasize that it's received income, actually recorded income will exceed, be exceeded by current spending plans. And there has to be some technique by which that is financed. He said it follows, therefore, that when growth is taking place, it's at least some sectors finance part of their spending by emitting debt. So again, Minsky was aware of it. He just didn't quite work out the full logic, but he was aware of it. That vision, that vision is there as well tied up with the proposition that you have to have the creation of new money. You can get it by an acceleration in the rate of turnover of existing money as well. He's covering that in the first part of that statement. But again, the whole link between change in debt, aggregate demand exceeding the in income from sale of goods and services, and the creation of new money is in Minsky. So 
but it still hasn't become part of post-Keynesian logic overall. So growing gets an essential part of a capitalist economy. It's not something we want to eliminate, which is one reason why I tend to stand outside monetary reformers who are often trying to find ways to have a monetary system that doesn't have debt. Now, I'm you know, not going to write blows out of the water by any means, but we have to see that the, the, in, the debt can play a, a fundamentally important role in a capitalist economy. If we replace it with something else, we have to make sure that other role is still fulfilled somehow. So this is the position, the, the aggregate position that we've got. And so, Minsky, we are kind of repeating myself. I'll dive past that slide, pardon me. Now, I think, again, part of the confusion that's applied comes out of how economists do dynamic modelling. And most economists are not taught dynamics. They learn, if they learn the dynamics, most of them learn nothing more than second-order linear differential equations, which they learn in third year or honours year or maybe even their PhD program. And they never really go beyond linear ones, and they don't really learn all the complexity theory stuff completely. So thinking in ex ante, thinking ex post rather than ex ante is part of the problem. And they, what they do when they do dynamics, they reach for their Excel spreadsheet and they do T and T minus one. You know, each row is different by a year type thinking. And that's just very, you can, you know, there are some times where discrete dynamics actually matters. But that's a very clumsy way of modeling a complex dynamics process like the economy itself. So we need to get beyond that. So I'm actually arguing in favour of more mathematics for economists, but correct that mathematics and tied up with history as well, and history of economic thought. So this whole idea of that income is necessarily equal to expenditure comes out of this confusion of ex ante and ex post, and Keynes again was aware of it in talking about the general theory in 1937. And if you're going to want to read Keynes properly, I'd actually recommend don't worry about the general theory read the papers in 1937, particularly the general theory of employment and alternative theories of the, of the rate, alternative theories of the rate of interest. There's a third paper as well. But those three papers really had Keynes clarifying what he thought in reaction to people who disagreed with him, whereas the, the, the general theory was developed in the, in the Cambridge circus where he was talking to Schraffer and, and Kahn and, and uh, Robinson and so on, who normally wouldn't disagree with him, as Schraffer did. So in this debate with Olin, he then said planned investment, he'd left out finance demand for money, is what he realised. In general theory, he had uh, transactions demand, which is the standard neoclassical thing, precautionary and speculative. But in these papers, he realised there's also a finance demand for money. And he said planned investment, i.e. investment ex ante, may have to secure its financial provision before investment takes place. He said there has to be a technique to bridge the gap. It's almost exactly the language that Minsky was using earlier. He said this service may be provided either by the new issue market or by the banks, which it is makes no difference. Now he's wrong on the last point. It's very different if it's made by equity than if it's made by new debt being issued in terms of its macroeconomic impact. The previous is effectively loanable funds. This is a uh, increase in money supply. I'm getting signals over here to slow down. Are we right here? To, uh, Janet, how long do we have, Francis? Pardon? Okay, all right. Can you, are you still coping with this? I know I'm dumping a lot of uh, theory on you. It's all okay? Nobody's fallen asleep yet or had a nervous breakdown? Good, okay. So you've got to understand the crisis using debt. And now I think I've justified this previous slide I showed you. Looking at that, crisis, yeah, but what crisis? Looking at the change in debt, bang. It's obvious why we've had the huge turnaround. To give you an idea of the scale there, that change in GDP is from about 14.5 trillion down to 14 trillion, so a $500 billion drop in GDP. The change in GDP plus change in debt went from 18.5 trillion to 11.5 trillion. That's why it was such a huge shock to the system. Now, the change in debt feeds into economic activity in a number of ways, and again, a bit of mathematics is necessary. But starting from saying that you've got income plus the change in debt as the source of monetary demand, and there's also two categories of supply, goods and services, which is all macro normally worries about, and financial assets, the turnover on the financial markets. So Schumpeter's proposition was that income is mainly spent on consumption and the change in debt is the main source of funds for investment. Of course, there's certainly retained earnings there as well. Minsky adds in that it's also change in debt finances Ponzi behaviour. So if you look at wages and profits largely going across to consumption and the change in debt largely to investment and net asset turnover, you now get a set of links that matter, uh, which I call Volra-Schumpeter-Minsky law, because Volra wasn't wrong if you're trying to get an accounting balance. He was wrong 
to ignore disequilibrium and the finance markets, which he thought he had to leave out to make the whole thing simpler. In fact, he left out the guts of capitalism in doing that, and he made his task harder, because mathematically what he tried to do we now know is impossible. You can't reach an equilibrium uh, vector of prices, even with initial endowments and so-called rational consumers. You can't get there. The equilibrium, A, doesn't exist. Uh, well, there's a whole lot of problems about it, which I can talk about in, 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 other, in other, other times. But it, he was wrong to even, he, his belief that he could get there was wrong. But if you generalize it and include the role of credit and money, then you can actually understand the way the capitalist system functions. So aggregate demand is income plus change in debt. Aggregate supply is income plus net turnover in asset markets. And if I then expand what net asset turn turnover is, it's the price of assets times the quantity in existence multiplied by the fraction that turn over in a time period. Now looking at macroeconomics, I can now link change in debt to what happens with GDP and therefore employment. So then that's the correlation I found beforehand was more causation than correlation. And then when you take a look at the rate of change of aggregate demand, you get the acceleration of debt turning up. And therefore there's going to be a relationship between the acceleration of debt and change in asset prices. And this explains both the great, you know, the crisis we've been through and the great moderation beforehand. And it also explains why asset bubbles have to burst. Because if this to remain positive relies upon that remaining positive, that means you've got to accelerate indefinitely. And nothing can accelerate forever. If you're in a car, you have ultimately hit its maximum speed. Or the police get you. You can't go faster than the maximum speed, therefore acceleration must be zero at maximum speed. And then of course you'll slow down. So looking back at the historic data now, this is the Great Depression data on aggregate demand and the impact of change in debt. And you can see that before the crisis, before 1929 struck, there was a small boost to aggregate demand coming out of change in debt. After it, enormous subtraction. And the difference that the change in government debt made was there, but fairly small. This is today's data. A much larger boost to aggregate demand from change in private debt and the impact that the change in government debt made on the depth of the crisis is substantial and turned around very rapidly. So we're back in the stage where there's a positive boost as of about mid-2010. So the change in that is adding to aggregate demand at that stage but of course it relies upon both sl a slowdown in the rate of reduction of private debt but a massive increase in the rate of growth of government debt which is where the deficit spending comes in. Without that deficit spending if you're actually down the negative side somewhere, the economy will be a lot worse. Now looking at the acceleration issue and how that relates to change in employment. This is the data from the 1920s to 1940s, correlating the acceleration of debt to change in employment. And you can see the correlation is pretty strong. And I'm correlating a second order, a second derivative of time to a first derivative of time in economic data. And I never thought there'd be any serious relationship there. I actually avoided exploring it because I thought, even though I knew theoretically the link had to be there, I thought the data just isn't going to support it. It's just, you're pushing your luck to try to find a correlation of any sort between a second derivative and a first in economic data, so I didn't bother. And then I was beaten to it by three economists, including two working for Deutsche Bank, Michael Biggs and uh, I think it's Thomas Peck and I've forgotten the third, Biggs, Mayer and Peck. So they came up with the paper and they called this a credit impulse. And I renamed it the credit accelerator because an impulse implies, you know, once off and it's gone. Acceleration is a permanent feature of a moving vehicle. I think accelerator is a better concept. So they first did the empirical work and then I followed up afterwards. So I've got to doff my cap to them and say they got there first on that one. This is the modern data. From 1980 to 2012. And you can see the strength of the correlation. We're now working with monthly data for, for, for employment and quarterly data for credit. So to get a correlation like that over a 40 over a 30 year period is pretty stunning when you're talking second derivative to first derivative of economic data. And you can see how deep the plunge was. The rate of deceleration of debt was greater than 25% of GDP when it hit. Compare that to the Great Depression, it was only about minus 18. That's why it was so much more a severe shock. And it's also why in the asset markets we got all those you know, banks being wiped out by it when most of them survived the, the Great Depression. And here's looking at what happened with asset markets. This is the Dow Jones deflated by the CPI. So I'm simply dividing the Dow Jones by the CPI, starting the index at 100 and plotting it forward from 1914. 
and the black line is the trend in that ratio. Now there should be a trend with shares but for two reasons. One is that firms don't distribute all their earnings, okay, and they plough them back into the value of the firm. So that, that gives you, you know, two reasons why the value of the firm should rise, the index should rise compared to the CPI over time. But I'm now in the next chart, this chart subtracts that share index from the trend. And it's pretty obvious which is the biggest stock market bubble in history. Okay. Not only is 1929 dwarfed by 1960, so now beaten by 1966, as it happens, that's the date that Minsky said was the time at which the American economy passed from being financially robust to financially fragile. But look where he got to in 2000 compared to that bubble. And you can just see all the, you know, each new revival uh, is still trending down. In the overall, I think we're back to back up to about here right now. The data doesn't quite go through to today, but we're still well below the peak that was achieved back in 2000. Now, then you're taking a look at the correlation of that acceleration in debt to change in the Dow Jones on an annual basis. The correlation back in the Great Depression from 1922 to 1940, again, a strikingly high correlation. I don't get anything quite so strong when I look at data because remember again, I'm looking at change in debt and correlating it with the well, acceleration in debt, overall debt and looking at the correlation with share market prices. Now, of course, there's many other factors that go into people putting their money in the market as well. It's in and out, you know, fear one day, euphoria the next, that sort of volatility there. Plus, you've also got, of course, the money's being used to buy houses. It's being actually used to build factories. It's not gamble at all. And I couldn't find, somebody might be able to help me here. If anybody hears this on, the, on YouTube, let me know if I've, where I can locate the data when I put it up on YouTube. I couldn't find marginal loan data for America, but I did find it for Australia in the RBA's data. And here's the correlation of acceleration of margin debt to change in the share price index in Australia. So what we're really seeing in the stock market, changes in the stock market are both driven by and cause acceleration in debt. What we're seeing is people being geniuses in the stock market is riding debt bubbles which is one reason why I want to abolish that whole link between change in debt and asset prices. That's also new, by the way. Looking at housing, the same proposition arises. This is the American house price index, which apparently is actually starting to turn at the moment in various ways. I don't think it's going to be sustained, but it's certainly there's rising house prices going on at the moment. It appears in the data, though I'm still showing it trending down in that particular chart. As you can see, there's no long-term trend. This, this is Case-Shiller index. Now, Robert Schiller is one of the uh, few me members of the American Economic uh, Establishment I really respect because he stuck his neck out back in two th before 2000, published a rational exuberance. He put this index together and he's actually moved a long way from behavior towards behavioral economics rather than neoclassical, but he's still well and truly respected as part of that group. So he's somebody who really put an emphasis on getting the empirical data. And this data he had, had together and Greenspan had access to this data. Okay, this data has been around for about 10 years before I've shown it here, but I think it's certainly available from about 2000, 2001 forward. Okay, so Greenspan, the reason I've got Greenspan's name on the chart there is this is what he said at that date to the Congress. A bubble in home prices is not a clear likely. At this stage, we're more than three standard deviations above the long-term variation. And so home price declines, were they to occur, likely would not have substantial macroeconomic implications. Why does anybody listen to him, apart from people going along to a stand-up comedy night? Yeah. But that's that's. I think it'll go down as the John Law of our generation, because John Law caused the Mississippi bubble. We had a good idea to begin with, and financed the you know the expansion of France and so on, but led to the Mississippi bubble and decimated French the French economy. So I think Grandspan will go down the same way for the American economy. Now the OECD. Nowhere near as uh, duplicitous as Greenspan on this front. This is an example of, of why this crisis was missed by conventional economics, because the modelling they use leaves out debt banks and money and presumes the economy is in equilibrium or slightly disturbed from it. So these are the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium, equilibrium models. So in June of 2007, this is the forecast they gave to politicians. Now, realise this OECD, we all read about the report in the newspapers but the treasuries of all the uh, countries around the world really want to get the best mark they can from the OECD. 
So this would be the reports would have been dumped on the desk of the treasurer and the prime minister as soon as they came out around the world telling them what to expect in the very near future, June 2007. And they said they didn't expect a downturn. And this is using the OECD's dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. And they're saying the current economic situation is in many ways better than we've experienced in years. So it's really telling all the politicians, relax. The economy is not going to cause you any trouble at all. Your re-election is assured. And they said they've stuck with the rebalancing portfolio, and I love this line. Our central forecast remains indeed quite benign. That's a bit like being told you've got a great heart, go out there and compete in the Boston Marathon the day before you fall over and have a heart attack in the garden. Sustained growth in OECD economies and strong job creation and falling unemployment. That's what they thought was going to happen. Well, it didn't what happened at all. Now, actually, I might just to give you a bit of a mental break. I know I have dumped a lot of stuff on you here. This isn't a bad time to drop break for coffee. It gets it's not ready. So I've got to keep on going. Sorry. <laughs> Pardon? It's almost 25 past, but uh, getting close. I'll, I'll go for the next five. Okay. So I'm going to get a bit of a primer on Minsky, and then I'll come put and put into the, the modelling terms. So having admitted bank debt and money from macro models and not seeing the crisis coming, we need to look at people who actually included bank debt and money all the way through. And Minsky was the person who brought that all together. Now, he was conventionally ignored by neoclassicals, and my favourite here is Ben Bernanke, because Bernanke got the job as Federal Reserve President, uh, Governor, largely on the argument that he was the expert on the Great Depression. You'll still see him described as that way. Now, having read his essays on the Great Depression, I'd say he's not an expert on the Great Depression. He's an expert on explanations of the Great Depression that are consistent with neoclassical theory. And the only explanation that's consistent with the neoclassical theory is the butler did it. You can't say that there was a suicide. The butler must have killed the governor, you know, the, the, the economy, because the economy can't have a breakdown. Therefore, it must be the fault of the people managing the money supply. Now, of course, to be an expert, you'd expect him to read everybody's views and take them into account. Here's what he did at Minsky. He said, Mince, this is the entire book. I found 48 words. I've dropped a few of them out, as you can see. But 48 words talking about Minsky and Kindleberger. As Minsky argued for the inherent instability of the financial system, but departed from the assumption of rational economic behaviour. And he has in a footnote, I don't deny the importance of irrationality in economic life, but it seems the best research strategy is to push the rationality postulate as far as it will go. So he refused to consider an alternative explanation of the Great Depression because it didn't fit in neoclassical theory. Now, of course, you get people reading it, but the trouble is they're coming from a neoclassical point of view. And one of my long-term friends and, and colleagues and all this struggle against woolly thinking in economics, a called Rod O'Donnell, is a professor at uh, University of Technology, Sydney. Rod's a, an expert on uh, the history of Keynes. And he made the point very well at a conference that Please don't go and, and, and read the originals and then tell us what they contain. Because when you guys read Keynes, you see Volras. When you read Minsky, you see Volras. You can't help but read the stuff and come out. Like, like they, if they read, they go and read the Koran and they, you, know, you get the Pope reading the Koran and he finds Jesus in it. It's, it's really a case that they, they really don't know how to comprehend this theory. They have to really let go of their beliefs and they don't do it. So Krugman and Eggerston did a paper which they called the Debt Deflation a fischer minsky coup approach. And what they did was they built an equilibrium DSGE model of Minsky in which banks and money didn't exist. They had debt that they didn't have money. And aggregate debt wasn't the problem, it was distribution of debt. Now, how could you read Minsky and get those results? Well, the reality is, first of all, Krugman did try to read Minsky, but he got Minsky's worst book, Stabilising an Unstable Economy. He didn't know which one to read, which is the best one. And he actually said the, um, the one says the platonic ideal of reading Minsky is better than the experience. But actually, when he told me, when he told in his blog that he was reading Minsky, I was one of the people who writes, say, don't bother reading that book. Get Can It Happen Again? Or get um, John Maynard Keynes, much, much better books. But Minsky's point of view, the thing that I see Minsky adding to Schumpeter in particular, because he was Schumpeter's PhD student, the thing he added is this consideration of what Ponzi units do what money borrowed not for productive reasons, as Schumpeter focused upon, but for speculative reasons, what that does. He says a Ponzi 
unit. Of course, he's not assuming they don't exist. They play an essential role in his model. A Ponzi unit is somebody who has debt commitments that exceed their income flow. So fundamentally, they're bankrupt. The only way they can continue in operation is by borrowing more money until they sell an asset. So they drive up asset prices because people worry, because in a period of tranquil growth, people worry less about the future. They're therefore willing to pay more for capital assets and therefore they'll accept people who've got a Ponzi situation. You go to the bank and say, I've got a lot of debt, I can't pay the mortgage, but I think I'm going to make a profit on selling the house. The bank says, well, that's a great idea. You know, house prices will double in seven years, no problem. So the financial system is generating the money that actually lets that happen and keeping it ticking over. So endogenous money and banks funding Ponzi schemes are essential parts of how Minsky envisages, cap envisages capitalism. And his hy hypothesis starts with an economy in historical time. Now that's two important words I've emphasized <laughs> both in different ways because history is ignored by neoclassical economics. They've abolished courses in hi economic history throughout the world. My university has a course they call Australia and the Global Economy. That's actually economic history by another name. And they don't include time. They have time at all. It's logical time, t, t minus 1 rather than historical time. And normally also they're looking at equilibrium outcomes. They're not looking at uh, genuine dynamics. If they have time change in their system, it's convergence to a future predetermined equilibrium. That's not dynamics. So Minsky said, let's start in historical time. Let's imagine we're talking 92, 93. And there's been a debt-induced recession in the recent past. The recession we had to have, as Paul Keating called it in Australia, the savings and loans recession in America. That means that both firms and banks are conservative about the amount of debt they'll take on. And therefore, only conservative projects are put forward. But because the economy has largely recovered from that crisis, most of those projects succeed. And therefore, firms and banks, both sides of the borrowing equation, revise their risk premiums and think, if we borrowed more money, we would have made a greater profit. They accept a high ratio of debt to equity, and they start to value assets more highly. And in Minsky's classic phrase, stability is destabilizing. A period of tranquil growth causes rising expectations. So even if you've got to equilibrium, because that's not the usual experience of capitalism, that causes a period of rising expectations. And I'm talking the telecommunications bubble and the dot commies here obviously, at that stage. Now, for a while, it gives you self-fulfilling expectations. You invest more. You lay all that optical fibre. Uh, increased investment occurs, and the economy grows more rapidly because of it. But you start to get to what's called the euphoric economy, and we saw the, you know, the pinnacle of that with the dot-com bubble. You know that the, in America, the, 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 the big event, advertising event is the Super Bowl, and you had companies paying an absolute fortune to advertise in the Super Bowl with negative cash receipts at the time because that was the, the beginning and the end with the 2000 Super Bowl. So totally euphoric expectations about what can happen. You know, massive companies like Pet.com, heard of them? They lasted until about 2001 and went bankrupt. At one stage, Amazon was valued at more than the entire airline industry in America. Yeah, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that, that rising speculation and the increased willingness to lend money, which, of course, causes the money supply to expand, and finances a lot of these riskier investments, which are losing money, so you're accumulating losses all the way through this apparent period of prosperity, leads to the emergence of Ponzi speculators. And of course, the entire working class was dragged into that through flip that house in America this time round. We have a cash flow that's less than your debt servicing costs, but you expect to profit by selling an asset on a rising market. And that drives up interest rates, commercial interest rates rise as a result of that. And you get a rising level of debt, more unsuccessful projects, uh, interest rates getting more expensive. And that causes, the combination means some firms that thought they were well-geared were no longer well-geared. You know, some failing projects, high cost of debt and so on. They sell some assets into that market. And rather than the asset market being as broad as we think it is, it's easily flooded. And once it floods, that's the end of the rising trend of asset prices. And that's the end of the Ponzi financiers as well. They're normally the very first ones to go bankrupt. My favourite will always remain Laurie Connell, who's an Australian. Ever heard of Laurie Connell? Uh, his nickname was Last Resort Laurie, and he was largely a financier of people like Alan Bond and so on, and the then a Premier of Western Australia, who, like Laurie Connell, spent part of his time at Her Majesty's Pleasure after the whole crisis, once said he'd never like to stand between Laurie Connell and a bucket of money. Well, Laurie Connell went bankrupt the day after the 87 stock market crash. One day, that's all he could survive. He got bailed out by Alan Bond, well, actually by Alan Bond getting money off Alan Bond's mates. 
to keep him going before he finally folded completely. So Ponzi's go bankrupt because they can't sell assets for profit anymore and they can no longer roll over their debt. Asset prices collapse. The debt to equity ratio rises for a while because if equity prices collapse and debt remains much the same. The money supply goes into reverse, investment evaporates, the economy slows down and you're back in a debt-induced recession. That's pretty much the tale of the 2001 recession. We've gone from 1993 to 2001. So in a way we're back where we started, but the process starts again at a, high, at a higher level of debt than it began the previous time, as you've seen in the economic data. And the best way to think about that in a, in a theoretical way is that effectively people are borrowing money during a boom and then have to repay that during a slump. So there's a tendency for the level of debt to ratchet up and the expectations get reset to, thank God we survived that one before you've got back to where you were at the first level of debt. So ultimately you can get to the stage where the level of debt overwhelms the economy and the whole economy crashes. And now I'm guessing it's a good time to stop and have a cup of coffee. Thank you.